Welcome to Top Shelf. My name is David Pierce, and this week we're talking about bikes. Bikes don't seem like they've changed that much over the years. They have pedals, and when you pedal them, they go forward. But there's actually a lot happening. So we're starting with electric bikes. They're not that new, but they're cool, and they're interesting, and I just really wanted to ride one. So I rode one. New York City and electric bikes have a particularly strained relationship. Lots of people use them, delivery men, and just people looking to get around without a car. But they're also illegal, and you can actually get a fine for using them. And there are a bunch of different reasons. It's been back and forth. It changes all the time. So we're here at a company called Nice Wheels. It's also NYC E-Wheels, where they actually sell electric bikes and scooters and folding bikes and all kinds of stuff. So I want to figure out how they're here, how they stay in business, and where they see the future of electric bikes going. My name is Peter Yuskauskas. I'm the manager here at the shop. Um, I've been here about three years. Uh, the store in itself has been here for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Overall, we became one of the first big dealers of electric bikes in the whole country. What was the technology like on an electric scooter 10 years ago? You know, noisier motors, a lot of chain-driven um, drivetrains uh, instead of having the motor inside the wheel. Um, so things have developed a lot in terms of batteries and also motors and a lot of new like sensor developments too. Why for you guys electric bikes and electric scooters and stuff, why is that particularly interesting to you guys? Well it's just, you know, part of it is having a little bit less dependence on gas, um, being able to get around in a clean, quiet way. Um, gas powered things are noisy in general. Um, they're easier to fuel up everywhere, but if you can charge your battery powered vehicle, it only takes a couple cents per day and you can get you know, really good range out of them. So for inner city commuting, you've got like 20 miles to go, you can totally do that with an electric bike. These seem perfectly designed for cities and maybe not as much for other kinds of people. Well, it depends. I mean, we have a lot of customers who are been bike riders for all their lives, you know, have been in, in good shape all their lives even, and like, you know, maybe they have a physical problem now with their knees or something where they can't, you know, get the same, you know, distance that they want to. Yeah. Like uh, my mom, for example, has a, a Bionics motor system installed in her bike and it allows her to keep up with my dad doing like 50 mile rides that she could nice. never do otherwise. Yeah. So, um, you know, we sell them to a lot of people who aren't in cities as well. You know? Okay, so you're in New York City and there's all sorts of complications with e-bikes in New York City. So I, I've, I've read a lot of things. Where do we stand now with electric bikes and especially New York City? Well, this is a confusing problem because the media will have you believe that electric bikes are evil and that they change people into evil people who will run you down on the street. So It's really not true. So know? is the logic basically that it's, it's quiet but it goes really fast and it's really heavy so they're definitely gonna I kill you? I think what it is is that there's always been a problem with delivery guys riding on sidewalks, riding the wrong way, and hitting people, not obeying traffic, not having licenses, and so there's been no accountability and it's always hard to tag like a certain thing as being the problem. Right. Now that there's electric bikes, it's really easy to be like, whoa, hey, look, the bicycle is different, therefore it's <laughs> causing the problem. It's their fault. But really what we see is that we have customers who are, are riding these bikes, commuting to and from work every day, are totally considerate, are, uh, are not giving anybody any hassle. And, but all you hear about with electric bikes is like, oh, I saw this guy riding down the sidewalk and he almost hit me with all his you know, food bags and whatever and he just throttled off down the street. I mean, the big thing is that they're heavier, so they're more dangerous because you know, they're moving at a fast speed, they're heavy and that's Which that is, is fair. dangerous. Sure. Yeah. So what you've seen in New York now is um, all the delivery guys have these vests and they have the name of the restaurant and a little ID number. Oh, and um, so I think what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a sort of a crackdown at first and um, then they're basically only gonna bother people who are breaking traffic laws or are working delivery that don't have this commercial kind of getup. Right. So the real problem there is not uh, is not the bikes, but the bikers. Like, and, yeah. and this is, I guess, an ongoing problem for people in general. It's like, you know, people in cars like to complain that bikers think they're pedestrians and sure. think they're drivers and just do whatever they want yeah. at any given time. I mean, for example, I read a study that last week seven people were killed by cars in crosswalks. You know, why isn't there a crackdown on cars <laughs> driving through crosswalks? Right. That's much more important. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, I'm sure that's causing many more accidents. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like that would be, you know, they should just get rid of cars and put everybody on electric bikes and that would like neatly solve this problem. Yeah. So what's, what's going to change? You think we're just going to get to the point where are they going to treat it like cars, where they're going to have to have license plates and stop at red lights and things like that, or like how do we, where, how do we figure that out? I mean, I see probably like in European countries, they're usually a little bit further in terms of regulations. If you can kind of take a cue from Europe. They're probably going to have a little bit more licensing, maybe some insurance thing. I mean, I don't think it has to go that way. I think 
we can all just be considerate and obey traffic laws and kind of like get along that way. Yeah. Because in a lot of other countries, these they're super prevalent, right? Like their their electric bikes are everywhere. Well, for example, our most popular electric bike, the Stromer, over the U.S., they probably sold 500 last year, but they sold 3,000 in, in Europe last year. Wow. So. So you think we'll, we'll land somewhere that makes sense with all this eventually? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's, it's here to stay. It's a cool technology. It's really changing a lot of people's lives for the better. And, um, you know, most of the cases is not people who are, like, uh, getting their lives ruined by being run over. It's people who are having their lives changed for the better, getting more exercise, staying healthy, enjoying the outdoors. Cool. So can we, can we see a few of these bikes? I want to yeah, like, see what, what's going on and actually take a look at some of the tech here. Okay, so let's start at sort of the low end. Like what's the cheapest, easiest way for somebody to get into this world? Sure, well we get that question a lot. Um, a lot of people are unsure how much to spend. Um, you see a lot of kits out there for like $300, $500, and it's like 1,000 watt motor, 15 amp hour battery. I don't know what <laughs> and, any of those words mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean what we sell is only like the best quality stuff. So we won't always have the cheapest, but we'll have the best stuff. So for example, a Bionics system, which is, this is the battery for Bionics. Um, yeah, this is something this that is you serious. mount on your bike and you replace the rear wheel with a motor wheel, just okay. like this, right? And then the battery goes on like where your water bottle would normally go. And so with that system, you can start at around $1,000 if you install it yourself. Um, it's a little low powered, but it's nice and lightweight. Mm -hmm. Again, this is assistance, it's not like a motorcycle. Right. So if it's low power, that means it's already more powerful than you are and you will ever be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's lighter, it's cheaper. And so in this case, I'm still pedaling. It just does a lot more every time I pedal. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. You'll see that with all the bikes we have pretty much. Um, we're all based on assistance. Uh, we don't want to replace your leg power, we want to like augment it. Then if I want to get an actual electric bike with everything built in, I don't want to, you know, stick this in my water bottle holder. What's what's next? Where do we go from there? The next thing would be a bike like this uh, Stromer. Um, this one is one of the latest technology that we have. The battery is actually in the tube here, and uh, you can remove it. I've pulled it out of another one of these bikes. So you've got this removable oh, wow. battery that uh, is all fancy. Purple. I like that it's purple. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's one that's orange too. If you like orange. I like that. <laughs> you gotta make the batteries look so, nice. So, you know, this again is like the it's highest awesome. level technology. This is the kind yeah. of cells that you would have in like an Apple computer battery, just like the best sort of thing. Just a ton of them. <laughs> yeah, and this is from TD High Tech, which is okay. a really good battery actually, and it's made in Taiwan. So, a bike like this, what you get is a much more powerful motor. Typically in the full electric bikes, you have like a 500 watt motor, okay. which is like way more powerful than Lance Armstrong, for example. Right. Don't quote me on that. But, um, I mean, yeah. I, I assume it's more powerful. It better be more powerful than that. Yeah, time, so. it's, it's super powerful. And then they tend to be also a lot more kind of cool and integrated. So they have like a little light up console here that has all your bike computer functions, like how fast you're going, how far you're going and all that stuff. These will tell you how much you've got left in the tank in terms of percentage. And um, yeah, you can select like modes of power from low to high. Cool. So the best electric systems will like sense your pedaling power like automatically and smoothly. Like as soon as you pedal, the motor just engages and you're like, whoa, how did I get so strong? You know? just a superhero yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the thing that is the coolest part about electric bikes these days is they're not they're not like mopeds, they're not replacing your light power. You just feel like 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 great all of a sudden. You feel and like you can go really far. Time. Yeah. Minus so, all the steroids. It's great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, it's wild. This bike is super heavy, so it's like when I don't have any assistance, it's actually really awful. And then as soon as I turn it on, it just ain't no thing. If I'm on eco, this is the least mode. And this is like, every time I pedal, it's like I pedal, you know, three times. I really do want this just to get to work. Like if we could park bikes at our office, I would start, I would get one of these and ride it to work every day. I will say this battery is not dying slowly. Oh, ready? You want to see how fast I can go? Just between here and there. Ready? I'm going to see if I can keep up with this car. I mean, and the beauty is I don't even have to worry about cars because I'm much faster than all of them. I don't know if that's true. I have no science to back that up, but I think it's probably true, especially in New York. So having ridden one of these now, I kind of get why they're illegal. It's all of the fun of riding a bike and none of the work and you go about five times as fast. That's not to say I don't want one, I do. 
but I really don't want anybody else to have one, at least not until there's a way to make them a little safer or put a bell on it that makes sure it goes really loud. So for now, I'm the only one who has one, so I don't care. I'll see you later. I really want an electric bike, but I don't exactly have $4,000 burning in my pocket. Luckily, this guy found a better way. Evan Rogers, you actually built yourself an electric bike, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, so I assembled it. What was the difference? So you had all the parts. You yes. didn't like make well, a battery. You can retrofit a regular bike frame with all the parts you need to run an electric bike. Um, and it's a lot cheaper than buying a ready-made, pre-made electric bike, probably by the order of a few thousand dollars. So Really? Yeah. It, definitely pays off to do it yourself. Okay, so like in, in your case, what where do you start? What, like, what do you do? You're like, I want to build an electric bike. Well, yeah. they sell kits, like you can buy kits on Amazon, okay. um, you can get them on eBay, uh, or you can buy them piece by piece uh, from various like enthusiast shops online. Okay, so what do you need? You need like a back wheel with the right kind of motor on it. You can it, actually right? get a front or back wheel, depending yeah. on what you're, what you're, you're into. fancy like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like wouldn't, if you had the front wheel, that would be terrifying because it would just like take off and without you. Well, I and mean, then... if you're going short distances and you there aren't a lot of hills, like a front wheel is usually cheaper because okay. uh, it's usually a smaller motor. Um, and it's also a lot easier to like remove and attach because of oh. the front wheel Makes attachment. Sense. Yeah. But you also need a, the throttle assembly. You need a electric brakes okay. so that you know when you when you stop the bike, it you know stops the motor. <laughs> um, Solid plan. You need a control box that just kind of controls all the electronics, and you need a battery. And that's pretty okay. much it. And all, it all just comes in a kit that you just sort of screw yeah, actually, on? Yeah, actually, it's like, like the... I mean, if you, if you have any uh, experience just repairing or maintaining bikes, it's easily within the realm of your skills. Like, so tell me, walk me through, like, the process. So you buy this kit, it shows up. Yes. Ready, go. So one thing you got to kind of consider is that the torque of a large rear motor mm -hmm. might actually be a little bit too much for thinner road bike frames. Interesting. So a hybrid frame or a mountain bike frame is really kind of more okay. better better suited makes sense also it just it all kind of just holds together it feels a lot better if you have a mountain <laughs> bike frame because there's a lot It'd be there's, kind of rickety otherwise yeah, yeah it's a lot of power behind it yeah. but usually the back motor in one of these kits is actually fully is already attached to the tire okay so you basically you just remove the back tire um and kind of replace it with this entirely different motorized back tire right um you kind of snake the wires through the frame on the back part and uh Replace your existing brakes, the electric brakes, kind of mount the throttle up mm -hmm. on the top, and find a place for the control box and your battery, and you're good to go. Okay, so this is like an afternoon project that you yes. can theoretically just, you know, flip the bike over in your backyard and just do. Yeah. I feel like this would also be a great thing to get horribly wrong on your first try and either Definitely. launch yourself into the stratosphere or just like nothing would happen. I don't like, know. Well, it's, pedals it's, don't even it's work pretty well. straightforward. Yeah. Um, the pedal detection, actually, now that you mentioned it, can be a little funny because okay. there's a little like motion detector that you put near the right. pedals. Um, but I actually found that to be really annoying and I just never used it. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Uh, also, it's just way more enjoyable to just throttle it just as hard as you can. Yeah, it just feels awesome. Yeah, one of the places where I went wrong is I thought that um, I would need a huge 40 amp hour battery. Okay. Um, this was back when I was in school. I was traveling between two and three miles to campus every day. Um, just riding to classes. Just riding to yeah. classes. Which is, just, I feel like what most people need is about right. that range. It's like I, for me, I'm, it's the same way. I need that ride to work and from work every day. That's all I need. Yeah, um, and I, I, you know, I was on a really, steep incline both ways actually depending mm -hmm. on which way you would get to my apartment so three miles so this like three like miles i mean but it accumulated like going back and forth between campus and classes like 10 miles a day okay but i would have to charge my my 40 amp hour battery maybe once every week and a half really it was overkill like crazy and, and a 40 amp hour battery would be like enormous yeah it's and very heavy, large right? yeah. very heavy um and i really wish that i had gotten a smaller one because it does add a lot of weight and and it just makes the bike very cumbersome. Yeah. Especially considering that when I originally got the bike, the battery was mounted behind the tire above above it. Interesting. So the center of gravity was very high um, and shifted towards the back, and it made it very awkward. Yeah. Um, I ended up retrofitting the battery into the center of the frame, which helped a lot, but it was still a very large battery. Um, it's like you try to carry that thing upstairs, and you're just you're going to die. On your yeah, upstairs. and the other thing I w wish I would have done was was um, buy the frame and all the parts separately so that I could have chosen like a higher quality mm. aluminum. So you ultimately got a smaller battery and it was just, you fit it to what you needed. Yeah. This was the big thing I was worried about uh, seeing all these folks with the electric bikes at Nice Wheels is that they have, their range is like 
40 miles, some of them. And that's like, that's nice. Yeah. But you know, people get mad about their electric cars with 300 mile range. And right. like, I get that it's different, but it's still, I would worry. But I guess for most people, it's just like, it's, you I, know, know. I need to go a you few can, miles at a time. And then yeah. worst case, it just becomes a bike. I would really much rather have a lighter bike with significantly reduced mile. Like even if you can only go 15 miles in a day, Yeah. Um, I'd really much rather have that and take it like actually in two buildings instead of like struggling with a <laughs> right. with like an 85 pound bike assembly. Yeah, fair. Um, so how much did you spend on this whole thing? The whole say? thing was 750 bucks, which and was pretty good. Like but including a, a bike frame? Yeah, including the okay. bike frame. That's the thing is the bike frame was, yeah. It's just not a good bike frame. Spend a bit more on, <laughs> on a fair bike enough. frame. I mean, that's still, that's a quarter of what some of these electric bikes yeah. that we saw were. You don't have to spend four or $5,000. Right. Um, if you really pick out a good kit, one that fits your needs well, and uh, use a quality bike frame. I mean, you might go over a thousand dollars, but a lot of enthusiast or well-designed pre-made bikes are well over the two yeah. or three thousand dollars. So I'm mark. assuming I, I know you relatively well, and I'm assuming you looked at every single kit on the internet before picking one. Yes. Uh, Why did you pick the one you picked? Um, that battery. It was in a, the. You're just like, give me all that battery. Well, the ba yeah, the battery by itself usually costs like $350 okay. for like a 40 amp hour battery. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that may have gone down slightly since I got it, but I got the most battery for my buck, which I feel like was a good thought process at the time Makes until sense. I really came to grips with how much it actually weighed. So is that the big difference between all the options you looked at is just battery? Yes. Everything else? Because it's all basically the same well, assembly, right? Well, the the 500 to 700 watt motor that I got, I wouldn't skimp on that. Okay. Because uh, it'll take you up a pretty steep hill, but not without a little bit of help. But anything less than that, I think it would really chug. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're just on flat ground, I mean, it really depends on your situation. Yeah. So if you are, like, here in the city and you, it's really pretty flat, um, don't spend as much on a motor. You won't need it. Yeah. it. I mean, it'll go, it might take you pretty fast, but, I mean, it's also pretty dangerous. Well, um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's my other question here is, like, on, on one hand, I feel like it's, more dangerous just because you made it yourself <laughs> Slightly. Uh, but on the other hand like did you feel uh you know you're in a college situation it's there's yes. a lot of people around did you feel unsafe like I, I haven't spent that much yes. time on an electric bike Gosh. but it was terrifying i yes. almost killed so many i mean people. i got used to it and like it yeah. wasn't the experience was not terrifying but well and it seems like to me riding this thing with bike brakes but a motor yes. just felt terribly like yeah. inefficient it was like oh i'm gonna just use these little handles and that'll stop me it's like, no, it doesn't stop know. you. It just cuts the motor. You've <laughs> right. got, like, you have to put, apply the mechanical pressure to stop yeah. your body and like a sixty pound or a sixty pound battery from moving at like a pretty decent clip. So, yeah, I think like, I got going at like thirty miles an hour. Yes. Well, it was crazy. It's pretty scary on yeah. a bicycle. Yeah. Um, so I mean, well, first of all, you should definitely wear a helmet. Um, I mean, few people ever do, but Fair. if you're going thirty miles an hour on a motorized uh, piece of equipment. I'm going to recommend that you yeah. use a helmet. Fair enough. So speaking of safety, that's actually one of the big things that we looked at this week. Uh, there's a lot of issues here. City bike doesn't require that you wear a helmet in New York, and accidents have gone up because of it. And electric bikes, as Evan said, will almost definitely kill you if you don't wear the right helmet. So we went to NYU to talk to a professor there about what they're doing and what they're working on to make helmets not only safer, but cheaper and lighter and better so that you'll actually wear the thing and stay alive. My parents always wanted me to wear a bike helmet when I was a kid because, you know, it keeps me alive. But I never wanted to. It was big and ugly and made my hair look funny. But there were people trying to solve that. We're here at the Polytechnic Institute at NYU to talk to Dr. Nikhil Gupta, who's worked on helmets for Olympians, the military, athletes of all kinds. And basically his goal is to make the safest, best looking, lightest, coolest helmet on the planet. And it all starts with foam. So, okay, so first, uh, sort of at a very broad level, what, what happens in this lab? What are you guys working on in here? Well, we work on understanding how materials absorb energy, and that's a very important application when you look at helmets. Mm -hmm. You are looking at a very small space in which a lot of energy has to be absorbed. We don't work on individual products. We mainly work on developing materials mm -hmm. and uh, finding out what kind of uh, loading conditions those materials will be working well in. Mm -hmm. So we have six different kinds here, right? So what, what differentiates, I guess, sort of, you know, my, my scientific knowledge is mm -hmm. lacking. So what, what differentiates sort of one foam from the next? So there are a few things that you can look at the foams. If you look closely that the cell size of these foams is different, that mm -hmm. means how big the pores are right. in these foams. And that kind of determines the density of these materials. Okay. And uh, how much energy they would absorb 
uh, is related to the density of a foam. Mm -hmm. The denser the foam is, it may absorb more energy compared to a much more lighter sure. weight foams. Okay. But now we have new methods of making foams lighter, but increasing their energy absorption capability. Mm -hmm. So some of these fancy firms, not these ones, but the ones that we are working in developing new ones, might actually involve things like carbon nanotubes or nanofibers. Interesting. So which keep the firms low density, but at the same time they absorb a lot more energy mm -hmm. than the traditional firms. Dr. Gupta told us that what he's testing isn't how aerodynamic your helmet is or how cool it looks. He's not testing any particular helmet at all. He's focused on foam, every kind of foam you can imagine, and about 10,000 other kinds too. Foam is the backbone of your helmet. It's what absorbs the impact when you fall off your bike or get punched in the head. And depending on what you're doing, you need something very different. In his lab, Dr. Gupta tests the power of foam over and over. He's constantly trying to find how much of a beating a certain type can take. What if there's a pebble flying at it at 100 miles an hour? Or if you're on your bike skidding along the ground on a hot summer day, what happens then? Dr. Gupta knows the effects of temperature, vibration, and time. He also knows what happens if you fire a gun at it. In terms of its ratio of density to strength, the foam he makes can be stronger than steel. Of course, everyone needs different foam, though. Dense foam is heavy foam, and dense foam might not be what protects us best anyway. Dr. Gupta works with the military and Olympians and regular people like me. He's designing armor for the military that's both incredibly light and incredibly strong. He's worked with Olympic boxers who need a helmet that will take repeated abuse. He's also worked with equestrians who need to be able to fall off a horse and survive. Those riders need a helmet that will take huge impact once, rather than lesser impact over time. Or Olympic cyclists who spill off their bikes at huge speed and skid along the ground. Each needs a different kind of foam for a different kind of impact. Dr. Gupta is making sure helmets do what they really have to do, keep us safe. And that's it for our show. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks to the team at Nice Wheels for hanging out with us. Thanks to Dr. Nikhil Gupta and the team at the Polytechnic Institute at NYU. And thanks to Evan Rogers for probably convincing me to buy a bike that's gonna kill me. We'll be back next Monday and we'll see you then.